Everybody say hello to Luke. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Please control your enthusiasm. Hi. Oh, he's on. Is, is he on the computer? No. Is he inside? Oh, we oh. should get him on here, huh? We should get him on Teams. All right. Yeah, he should. Uh, he, he's like in quarantine for two weeks. Oh. Uh, for the second oh. time, Luke. For the second time. Yeah. Anyway. Okay, so there's not much to do here. I'm just going to go through what it's saying. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Okay, so, so let's jump to this blah, blah. All right. All right, so here, so we're looking at this whole thing, okay? So sometimes they're going to use the word minimum, and there's three other words they're going to use with that. One is relative. I'm sorry, two other words. Relative minimum or absolute minimum, okay? Absolute minimum, so this is an example of absolute minimum. An absolute minimum is when it's lower than any other functional value there. So in this one, this is, a, this is on a closed interval. Okay, I guess I should have passed through that part. It's on a closed interval. So up here, that's also an absolute maximum. Now, the weird thing is, sometimes this absolute minimum is also called a relative minimum because it's lower than anything around it. So, but if it's absolute, it's always relative, right? But that's not quite true, so it gets confusing there. All right, but look at this one. So this has a relative minimum, but what I want you to notice, but this one does not have a maximum because of the open circle at the end. Okay, so let's say the open circle is the coordinate uh, 2, 6. Let's say the open circle is coordinate 2, 6. Or 2, 5, rather. Sorry. Okay. So, so, but there is no maximum. I mean, you might argue, well, isn't 5 the max? Well, it doesn't reach 5. Okay. And you could say, well, what's 4.9? Well, there's one higher than that. It's 4.99. And there's one higher than that. It's 4.999. So you don't actually reach a maximum. So this has no maximum value. And then the third example, there's a hole here. So that means this one doesn't have a minimum. Okay, so this open business is a royal pain when it comes to max and mint. All right. Now, this theorem is going to be very easy at the beginning and very easy to forget at the end. Because you're going to learn a bunch of other stuff that's going to, it's going to look like it supersedes this, but it, this, this theorem never gets superseded. Okay, this theorem always holds, but it's always easy to forget once we do the next section. Okay, it's called the extreme value theorem, and it has to be a closed interval. Okay, after this section, we're going to be dealing with open intervals. And then every once in a while, I'm going to throw a closed interval at you, and this theorem kicks in. Okay, so whenever you see a closed interval, Closed interval looks like this, where you have a square bracket, number, comma, number, square bracket. If it's a closed interval, this theorem always kicks in. And this says, if it's a closed interval and it's continuous, there's always going to be a maximum and minimum. Always. That doesn't guarantee that they're unique. Right? You can have a constant. So the max and minimum are the same. Okay? But if you have a closed interval and it's continuous, then it will have both a maximum and a minimum. So how does this one break the rule? It's not a closed interval. It's open on the right. Actually, it's open on both sides. Okay? So this, does, this doesn't fit the extreme value thing. What's this one? How does this break the rule? It's not continuous. Okay. All right. So the extreme value kicks extreme value theorem kicks in if it's continuous and closed. Then you're going to ignore anything you learn after this section and use this theorem. Okay. And I will remind you again and again. All right. Critical numbers. A critical number. Um, is when the derivative is either zero or undefined. A critical number is the x value where the derivative is zero or undefined. 
Does that say that anywhere? No. I don't know why they did that. They talk about critical numbers and they don't tell you what it is. Right. Huh? Alright. Okay, let's look at this graph. So we have this graph of f of x equals x cubed minus 3x squared. There is a relative maximum here. This is a relative maximum. That's a relative maximum. But then you have a relative minimum down here. Okay, it's relative because can you imagine? So this is this is going forever, right? This is not saying this is a closed interval. This is going forever. You can imagine that this would just keep going and going and going and going and going. So this is not an absolute because there are points over here that are higher than that. And this minimum is not an absolute minimum because there's points over here that are lower than that. But they're considered relative max, relative min. They're important because they give you the shape of the graph. The relative maxes and mins give you the shape of the graph. All right? All right. Uh, so they have the definition of relative extrema. So extrema includes both maxes and mins. Okay? And they're talk, always talking about open intervals when we talk about relative. If there's an open interval containing a minimum, then f of c is called a relative maximum. Okay, I think this definition is not particularly helpful. I want you to use your intuitive idea. You, can you tell that's called kind of relative max? I mean, it's higher than anything around it. That's a relative min. Okay, so there are some definitions in math where it helps you understand the thing. But sometimes the definitions don't really help you at all. Sometimes it's just confusing. I think this is one of those that's confusing. Unless you're Victoria, then you get it. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> if you ever get tired of that, you can just tell me to shut up. Okay. It's okay. I'll get over. All right. Ah, here's a critical number. So this is important. So this is a good definition. So f is defined at c. So f has to be defined at c. That's the beginning part. In fact, that's the part most people forget, that it has to be defined. This is the original function, though, not the derivative. The original function has to be defined at c. And then it says f prime of c equals 0, or it's not differentiable at c. Then it's a critical number. So the, this is the part that most people forget. Okay, so the f is not differentiable at c, it's a critical number. But most people remember that if it's equal to zero, that's good. Okay. And then another part of people forget that it has to be defined. Okay. So these two are the most easily forgotten things because we do most of our work at this thing. If this happens, then this is definitely happening. Right? Okay, so this is the most common thing, so people think it's always this, but it's not always this. This happens a lot, and this happens a lot. Just not often enough that people remember it. So try to remember it, okay? All right, so look at this example. So what they're trying to show you that this is a max, right? And, but there's also a critical number there, okay? And in this example, f prime of c does not exist. So the derivative does not exist at x equals c. And c is a critical number. And here's another one. You have a horizontal tangent line, the derivative is equal to zero. C is a critical number. So the left one is the example of where the derivative does not exist, and the right one is the example when the derivative is equal to zero. And the extrema only occur at critical numbers. They only occur at critical numbers. So if you're given two critical numbers, then you know it only takes a turn at those two points. Here's the bad news. Just because it's a critical number doesn't mean you're going to have an extremum. So you can be given critical numbers, but it's not necessarily an extremum. Okay, so this guideline is not too bad. And this is based on the extreme value theorem. Okay, this one's based on the extreme value theorem. How do I know that? Continuous closed interval. So that's the extreme value theorem. Find the critical number. That's what we're going to do first. Then you evaluate each critical number in that open interval and then plug in the endpoints. So you need to find all the critical numbers, 
plug it in, plug in the endpoints, and then look at which one's highest, which one's lowest. So the highest is maximum, lowest is minimum. Let's do 1A. So we're looking at this function. We're looking at this closed interval. This is a polynomial. So polynomials are always continuous. All right? So to find the critical number first, you take the derivative. So right now I'm trying to find the critical number. So that's going to be 12x cubed minus 12x squared. Set that equal to 0. Factor out of 12x squared. And I get what? x minus 1. So that means I have zeros at x equals 0 and 1. Agreed? And then the easiest thing to do is just make a t chart. x and f of x. And I don't really care what order you do it, because uh, it's not, but this is the math person in me. It says negative 1, 0, 1, 2. OK? So this is the left end point. Negative one's the left end point. Two is the right end point, right? Negative one's left end point, two is right end point. And then these are the critical numbers in between. But you don't have to do it in that order. You know, if you do it, oh, let's say you did the end point first and then the critical numbers, that's okay. It just, you know, math teachers have to do things certain. Way. Okay. Now just plug it in. Plug this into the original function. You're not plugging into the derivative, you're plugging into the original function. So plug negative one into that, you get, what, seven? Check my math. Plug 0 into that, you get 0. Plug 1 into that, you get negative 1. Plug 2 into that, you get something I can't do with my head. So 2 to the 4 is what? 16? Yeah. 16. And 4 times 8. So that's 48 minus 32 is 16. So this is my minimum. And there's my max. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's, that part's easy, OK? But it's also easy to forget. This, this, for some reason, even though it's easy, this is a theorem that students frequently forget. Soon as you get a closed interval, this is your path, OK? Because you're going to learn some other tests that tells us relative min, relative max. And students want, those are easy too. Okay? But for a closed interval, you have to use the extreme value. All right. Find the extreme of that. Great. Closed interval. All right. So we go take the derivative. F prime of x equals 2 cosine x plus 2 sine 2x. Two right? This 2 comes from the derivative of 2x, and the sine change because the derivative of cosine is negative sine, so it's minus a negative sine. Okay? So I had to use a chain rule on that. Now, set that equal to 0. So this is where some of you, well, how do you solve that? OK, so here's the deal. I have a double angle here. And over here, I have a single angle. Those don't mix. It's easier to change the double angle to a single angle. The double angle formula for sine is, so I'm going to put that over here. So if I have sine 2x, that's the same thing as uh, 2 sine x cosine x. This is a very commonly used rule. you got to know that rule. So it's 2 cosine x plus 2 times, and I'm replacing the sine 2x with that. So that's going to be 2 sine x cosine x equals 0. So that gives me 2 cosine x plus 4 sine x cosine x. All right, now we factor this. There's a common factor of cosine and 2. So we take a 2 out of 2 as well. So that becomes 1 plus 2 sine x equals 0. Set each factor equal to 0. So you're going to do 2 cosine x equals 0. And 1 plus 2 sine x equals 0. 
So when is cosine equal to zero? And they give us an interval. They give us the interval zero to two pi. When is cosine x equal to zero? Anybody remember? Luke, do you remember? No, oh, I don't. <laughs> so it's pi over two, three pi over two. This one says, when is sine x equal to negative one half? And that's one. So that's the third and fourth quadrant. So that's seven pi over six and 11 pi over six. So this one's painful because there's one, two, three, four, five, six points to check. Right, you've got to check all four of these and the endpoints. So we're making a big chart here. Give me pause. I'll pause while people catch up. Did I go too fast? Well, I'm sorry, I can't really slow down. But you can ask questions while we wait. So for the rule on um, sine two x equals two sine x plus sine x, would that also mean that just sine x equals sine x plus sine x? Sine x equals two sine half x cosine half x. Okay. You have to take half the angle. Chart. So I'm plugging in zero. So what order are these in? Pi over two, seven pi over six, uh, three pi over two, eleven pi over six, and two pi. And I'm going back to the original. Uh oh. So now I'm going to be tested. So sine of zero is zero, cosine of zero is one, so that's a negative one. Sine of pi over two is one, so that's two. Cosine of pi is negative one, so it's two minus negative one is three. Is, is anybody checking me on this? Anyway, following what I'm saying, and contradict me if I'm wrong, all right, seven pi over six. Cosine of 7 pi over 6 is negative root 3 over 2, so that's negative root 3. Well, I'm going to write this down because I'm not going to be able to keep track of this. And then sine of, so this is now 7 pi over 3 because it's sine 2x, right? Sine 2x. I'm plugging in the wrong thing. It's cosine 2x. Did I do that for that one? Did I plug in the wrong one for that one? Okay. All right. Did I do it for this one? Let me cover that up because I'm going to keep doing that. I'm going to double check real quick. Sine of pi over 2 is 2. Cosine of pi. Is, okay, all right, that was right. All right. 7 pi over 6. That is negative. All right. Negative root 3. All right. Okay, no mistakes. All right. Cosine of 7 pi over 3. What's cosine of 7 pi over 3? 7 pi over 3 is pi over 3. So that's 1 half. So it's minus a half. Anybody checking me? You guys are killing me. <laughs> Alright, 3 pi over 2. Uh, plug in 3 pi over 2. Okay, sine of 3 pi over 2 is negative 1, so that's negative 2. This looks wrong. We'll have to come back and check on that. Plug in 3 pi over 2, that's 3 pi. That's same as pi. So that's negative 1, so that's plus 1. So that's negative 1. See, that one looks right. Plug in 11 pi over 6. So that sine of 11 pi over 6 is negative 1 half, so that's negative 1. And plug in 11 pi over 6. Yeah, that, that's definitely all right. 11 pi over 6. That's 11 pi over 3. Cosine of 11 pi over 3. That's 1 shy of 12 pi over 3. 12 pi over 3 is 4 pi. 4 pi is the same as 0. So it's going to be positive, 
pi over 3 version, so that's root 3 over, no, it's 1 half. So it's minus a half. So it's negative 3 halves. Plug in 2 pi, and I get uh, 0 minus 1, so it's negative 1. Let's double check this one. I think this one's wrong. 7 pi over 6 is wrong. Okay, I think 7 pi over 6 is wrong. Plug in 7 pi over 6. Sine of 7 pi over 6. 7 pi over 6 is here, so that's negative 1 half. So that's negative 1. So yeah, it's not root 3, it's negative 1. And plug in 7 pi over 6 there, and it's 7 pi over 3. 7 pi over 3. It's in the first quadrant, so it's positive 1 half, but it's minus half. So yeah, there you go, negative 3 halves. All right. So what's the max? 3. And the min, there's two of them, but it's basically the same value, negative 3 halves. So you have a max here, and you have a min at negative 3 halves. Here's the good news. So some of you might get confused. Well, there's two mins. Do I say there's two mins? Usually they just want the, what the y value is. So there's a minimum y value of negative 3 halves. There's a maximum y value of 3. Okay. They might say, where do the mins occur? Okay. They, might, they might ask that. Then you would say 7 pi over 6 and 11 pi over 6. And the max occurs at x equals pi over 2. All right. Continue. So that's the extreme value theorem. And I think that's enough to do the homework. Oh, never mind. The homework is on the whole section. Okay. All right. So how are we doing on time? What time is it? Uh, 10.08. Oh, we got plenty of time. Yeah. All right. Yeah. OK, determine, nope, finding the minimum slope. Finding the minimum slope? Finding the minimum slope. All right, find the smallest possible slope with a tangent line drawn to the curve. So we're looking for a minimum slope, all right? So how do you find the slope? You find the slope by taking the derivative of the function. So this is what, 6x squared minus 6x plus 4. <coughs> This question really doesn't belong in this section. <laughs> now, but I want to find a minimum of this, right? This is the minimum I want to find. I want to find a minimum of this. So that means I've got to take the derivative again, which gives us 12x minus 6. Now, we know this is a parabola. So the min is going to occur only once. It's going to be min or max. Do you know which way this is facing? Just forget the fact that it's this thing up here. Which way is this parabola facing? Facing upwards. Facing upwards. So it's a min. So yeah. from, from other information, we know this has a min. Okay. So you set this equal to 0. So you get x equals, what, 1 half? All right. Find the smallest possible slope with a tangent line. So you take the 1 half, and where do I put it? To find the smallest possible slope, where do I put it? In the first derivative. In the first derivative. So what is f prime of 1 half? That's 6 times 1 half squared minus 6 times a half plus 4. So that's 6 fourths minus 3 plus 4. That's 3 halves. Minus 3 is negative 3 halves. Plus 4 is Five halves? Is that right? Somebody check on that. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Um, what? What Could you possibly have to take like a third derivative? Or would you only do two? Yeah, we could take a bunch of derivatives. We're, we're, here's the bad news. Sometimes derivatives loop back, like it was sine and cosine, right? They keep looping back. So we may have to take several derivatives. So yeah, 
one or two, that's not the limit. Okay. In fact, some of the stuff we did, remember the first derivative was velocity, second derivative was acceleration, third derivative has a name too, it's a jerk. It's how you jerk. <laughs> oh. All right. All right. Number three. I thought that was a joke. No. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a joke, but uh, and we never really discuss it in capitals. It's just fundamental. All right. All right. These are true or false statements. The maximum of function that is continuous on a closed interval can occur at two different values in an interval. True or false? What do you think? We just had two mins, right? Mm -hmm. So we can have two maxes, so that's true. Uh, no, can mean? occur. It says can occur. Oh, I don't like that language. Can occur, so yeah, true. It could happen. Were those absolute or just relative? Okay, good question. So whenever they use the word maximum without a description, like without an adjective, they generally mean absolute. Okay. But I'm going to use the word like for both of them, absolutes and relatives, okay. simply because I'm too lazy to say the word relative. Okay. If a function is continuous on a closed interval, then it must have a minimal on the interval. True or false? True. True. That's the extreme value theorem. So there must be a minimum. If x equals c is a critical number of the function, then it is also a critical number of g, where k is a constant. True or false? False. Well, so where, how do you get a critical number? Where does a critical number come from? Um, the derivative, um, right? So what's the derivative of f of x? f prime of x. What's the derivative of g of x? f prime of x again. So yeah, if it's a critical number here, it's going to be a critical number here. Okay, because with the derivative of k is zero, so whatever makes f prime of x equals zero, it's going to make g prime of x equal zero. So yes, that's true. If x equals c is a critical number of the function, then there's also a critical number of g of x, which is equal to f of x minus k, where k is a constant. What about that one? No, that's a no. Because this is a transformation to the right or the left, right? This moved it left to right, so the critical number has to move too. So this is false. False because transforming to because transforming horizontally. E, let the function be, let the function f be differentiable on an interval i containing c. If f has a maximum value at x equals c, then negative f has a minimum value at x equals c. So all you did was flip it. If that's a max, then that's a min. True or false? Huh? True? Yeah. True. All right. F. A cubic function defined by f of x equals ax cubed, blah, 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 where a is not equal to zero. We'll always have exactly three critical numbers. True or false? Was that a non committal false? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, note, it says where A is not equal to zero, but they didn't mention anything about B, C, and D. So, what if the function is X cubed? How many critical numbers could that have? More than three. Only one. Right, because if you take the derivative, it's three X squared. How many zeros does that have? Oh, one. One. Okay. Right. So it says always have exactly three, and so that's false. So here's the kind of example. This only has one critical number. 
particle moves along a straight line according to this function. Find the maximum and minimum velocity. So first, let's find the velocity. So velocity is s prime t. So that's the first derivative. So that's going to be 4t cubed minus 12t squared plus 12t plus 0. All right. Now, we want the maximum minimum velocity. So we need to take the derivative of this. Even though it's acceleration, we're basically just taking the derivative of velocity. We don't care that it's acceleration. So that's going to be 12t squared minus 24t plus 12. And we have this closed interval from 0 to 3. Okay, So we're doing the extreme value here. Set this equal to 0 to find the critical values. So I factor out the 12, and I get t squared minus 2t plus 1 equals 0. So that's t minus 1 squared equals 0. So I make my chart. This is t and s of t. Oh, I'm sorry, v of t, right? Because we want the maximum minimum velocity. So that's going to be 0, 1, and 3. That's what we're checking, 0, 1, and 3. So we'll plug 0 into velocity. That's this one. Plug 0 into velocity is 0. Plug 1 in there, and you get 4. Plug 3 in there, and my brain just stopped. So 4 times, so where am I going to put that? So 4. 27 minus 12 times 9 plus 36. Ox of Okay, I need to calculate. Well, yes, I need to calculate. Minus 12 times 9 plus 36. And I got 36. Really? So there is the min. Now we want the maximum minimum acceleration. Good grief. All right. So we know this. So remember, v prime of t is acceleration. All right. And we already have that. That's the 12t squared minus 24t plus 12. But we want the max and min of that. So we need the derivative of acceleration, which is 24t minus 24. So this is equal to 0. 24t minus 24 equal to 0. And t equals 1. So we're still on that interval, 0 to 3. And this time we want acceleration. So I'll plug 0 in there, and I get 12. Plug 1 in there, and I get 0. Plug 3 in there, and I don't know what I get. 12 times 9 minus 24 times 3 plus 12. I got 48. So we have a min and a max. We have a min and a max. And that is section 1. Stop in the recording. Everybody say bye to Luke. <laughs>